This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. At Military History Night on October the 25th, Dr. Mike Bechtold of Wilfrid Laurier University cast some fascinating light on the Second World War career of a man Canadians usually know as a World War I ace, if indeed these days we know him at all, Raymond Collishaw. Thanks very much, Pat. Uh, thanks to Eric and uh, everybody at the RCMI for having me out tonight. I'm really thrilled to be here to talk to you about uh, my latest book, uh, Flying to Victory, and uh, Raymond Collishaw. I think everybody in the room knows a little bit about Raymond Collishaw. Am I right about that? It's not a name that's totally been lost to history. And I think you all know that he was a, a great First World War ace. He was uh, credited with 61 kills over the Western Front, uh, second to, uh, to Billy Bishop in uh, Canadian Air Aces in the Great War. And he really made his mark on history as a great war ace. But my interest in him isn't in his First World War career. And that sounds really strange. Um, I, uh, I come to this from uh, a study of tactical air power through uh, looking at how the Air Force was supporting the Army on the battlefield and um, spent a lot of time, my undergrad and my master's, looking at TAC Air in, in Normandy especially. And a lot of what happened in Normandy was developed out of the Western Desert Air Force, the, the famous Desert Air Force, um, fighting at El Alamein and uh, in the, the North, North Africa. And I was reading a, a book by the, uh, the, the great uh, New Zealand historian, Vincent Orange, and he had a throwaway line in there. And he said something along the lines of, there was this Canadian, uh, Raymond Collishaw, who had uh, earned his name in the Great War. But to my mind, his greatest accomplishments were in the Western Desert. And that really got my mind spinning because obviously I knew about his, his Great War achievements, but I knew nothing about his Second World War career. It was a total mystery to me. So I thought, well, I should learn a little bit about him. Well, that little line in that, uh, almost a throwaway line in that book, led to probably the better part of 15 years of research that finally came out into this book. And uh, I have to say my wife was very happy to see it finally published because she thought I would never talk about Raymond Collishaw again. Well, uh -huh, surprise, I'm still here. Still going to be talking about him for a while. And in fact, one of my next big projects is hopefully going to be a full-blown biography of the man because I think he's, he's a very interesting character. Um, the, uh, the title for my talk tonight um, comes from the fact that Collishaw was born in Nanaimo, B.C. in uh, 1893. Um, Amiens, the, the great battle of the, the Hundred Days starting on the 8th of August 1918, was probably his greatest achievement in the First World War. It wasn't his uh, aerial kills, his uh, success as one of the Knights of the Air. It was his um, learning how to do air-to-ground fighting in the Great War and uh, that all culminated at the Battle of Amiens where the RAF had a really major role to play in supporting the army on the battlefield. And then Benghazi. Benghazi obviously is a city in, in North Africa. I picked that one partly because it was um, kind of the culmination of Kalashaw's wars in the, the Western Desert, but it was also really interesting because um, as I was writing my dissertation, I was sitting in my basement writing about these long ago battles in 1940 and 1941 and the RAF bombing Benghazi uh, by night. And uh, I would go upstairs into the living room and I'd turn on the, the news, CNN, and there was the RAF bombing Benghazi once again. So it seems these things kind of come full circle. So I want to talk to you tonight about Collishaw and his entire career. I'm going to, I'm not going to give the, the common story. I'm not going to talk about his uh, daring do uh, aerial battles. I'll, I'll give you some little anecdotes about that because some of them are, are really interesting. But I want to kind of, I almost want to position him as a, a Flashman kind of character. Um, he wasn't quite the devil that, that Flashman was. But Collishaw had this ability to kind of turn up at key points in history. And a biography of him is not going to be a biography of the man. It's going to be a biography of the events that he played into during his career. Um, Amiens, um, some really neat stuff during the interwar period. And then the Western Desert, where the main argument of my book is that Kalisha had a real big role to play in developing Allied close air support doctrine, tactical air doctrine. And he didn't get credit for it. And we'll, we'll get into that story. <laughs> 
So sort of for the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you about Kuleshov. I'm going to throw this quote up, which comes out of his, uh, his autobiography. And it, uh, it really says a whole lot about the man. That's a photograph of him in um, uh, Tobruk in either late 1940 or early 1941. And it, it really is quite resounding that Kuleshov, the man, talking about his career, wants to say about it that what he accomplished in the Great War, the 61 kills, um, being one of the, the great aces on the Western Front, wasn't the, 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 the best part of his career. It was his days of command in North Africa. And uh, that's something that really deserves a, a much closer look. So like I said, Kuleshov was born in Nanaimo in uh, November of 1893. He was uh, the son of immigrants. His parents had come from uh, Wales. They had immigrated to the United States. At some point, they found their way up to Canada. And uh, his father was a, a miner by trade. He'd uh, sort of kicked around all over the place. He was down in California for the gold rush. He was up in the Klondike for the gold rush. And I think they ended up settling on Vancouver Island to uh, help out with the coal mines there. And, and that's where Kuleshov grew up. But the, uh, the sea had beckoned to him from a, a young age, and his father cut a deal with uh, the local um, uh, commander of the Canadian Fisheries Patrol Office, uh, Canadian F Fisheries Patrol Service, when he was um, still a, a teenager, sort of what we would look at as grade nine or 10, and sent him to sea. And he started off as a, a cabin boy on, on some of the Canadian ships that were plying up and down the the West Coast, uh, doing fisheries patrol work, stuff like that. And uh, over the years, he, he worked himself up. He, uh, by 1914, he'd become the uh, first officer of a, a ship called the FISPA, um, sailing out of Vancouver. And had done quite well for himself. And it looked like he was going to have a, uh, a nautical career. But at some point, he saw an airplane. And uh, it, it captured him. It, it was uh, a romantic moment for him. He, he looked at it, he saw, well, I could be sitting on this ship rocking about on the sea, or I could be flying above the clouds in, in this kind of romantic idea. And uh, as far as I can tell, he probably saw his first airplane at some sort of uh, air display in the Vancouver area around 1910 or 1911, and it never really left him. The start of the First World War, you would think that he would go into the Navy. That would be the, the natural career progression from the fisheries patrol service to the Navy, but he wanted to get into the Air Force. So he basically threw everything aside, uh, quit his job, and made his way to Toronto, where he was going to learn to be uh, a pilot. Um, and becoming a pilot in these early days of flying wasn't the easiest thing. You have to remember, flying was brand new at the time. Uh, the Wright brothers had uh, flown their first aircraft only in 1903, so just over a decade before the start of the First World War. And uh, air, air power was something entirely new with a, sort of the military angle. They knew that it could be useful, uh, perhaps in scouting, reconnaissance, but maybe not much more than that. Um, Ferdinand Foch, who became the generalissimo of the, the Allied armies in 1918, famously said in 1910 that uh, aircraft are, for, are good for nothing but sport. Well, he would be quite wrong in that. And I, I think that Kuleshaw really saw the potential. Um, I've got a whole bunch of photos of, of Kuleshaw that are going to come up uh, during this. And I'll kind of leave it to you to sort of play the, the Where's Waldo with him. But Kuleshaw is the, the guy sort of in the front center off to the left. He's got the cap on backwards and the goggles. Big smile. In all of his photos from the First World War, he looks like this big, goofy kid. Um, he's always got a smile on his face. He always seems happy-go-lucky. You would never know that he was as accomplished an air ace as he was by his photos, because he just looks like the kid next door and uh, not the uh, uh, sort of accomplished air ace that, that he would become. So he made his way to Toronto. He, uh, uh, the way it worked at the time was you didn't sign up for the air services. They only wanted um, accomplished pilots. So in order to join either the Royal Flying Corps or the Royal Naval Air Service, you needed to have a pilot's ticket already. And so you had to go to a private school to, uh, to do that. And uh, the only one worth mentioning in Canada at that point was the Curtis School in Toronto. And it was, um, it was sketchy, but it was, um, I think, safe to say less sketchy than some of the other uh, air training schools at that time. They actually had aircraft that could fly and uh, they could get you up and, and trained. 
Um, they expected you to pay $400 to do your training and uh, I forget the exact uh, amount that $400 is worth in, in today's dollars, but it was thousands and thousands of dollars. So for uh, a kid from Vancouver Island to find $400, it was, I mean, beyond his means. And uh, the, the, the school was so busy at the time that Kalashaw couldn't get in. He had to get his name on a waiting list, but even to do that, he had to pay $50. And that was the equivalent of months of, of rent and, and food for him. So he did that anyway. He waited. It was getting to be the, the fall of 1915. Uh, the flying season was almost over. And uh, he kind of showed his, his um, I guess, his leadership skills. He gathered a bunch of the, the pilots that were waiting together. And some of them were deciding to go off to, to Texas to, to do their flying down there but uh, he was having none of that. So he arranges to go up to Ottawa and meet with um, Vice Admiral Charles Kingsmill, who's the head of the Canadian Navy. I mean, you have to think about this. He's a, almost a teenager at this time, has no military training, but he's going up to see the guy who's leading the Canadian Navy. But he goes and does that. He has a private interview with Kingsmill, and he impresses Kingsmill to the point where Kingsmill uh, intervenes and says that, you know what, this isn't going right. Um, we shouldn't be treating you like you guys are. We're going to bring you into the, uh, the the Naval Air Service, and we're going to send you off to Halifax. And we don't have a training slot for you right now, but for the winter you can uh, go aboard HMCS Niobe, an old cruiser that was sitting in Halifax Harbor, and at least learn to be a sailor and learn some bits of the service. So they did that, and uh, before they even realized it, they were sent off to England, where by this time, uh, early 1916, the British had realized that um, their need for pilots was going to far outstrip the ability of civilians to uh, provide them. So they started to get into the business of training airmen themselves. And Kalashaw was among the first that were trained in the service. So he went over to uh, Royal Naval Air Station in uh, Redcar, which is in the, the Midlands in uh, the UK, and learned how to be a pilot. I would love to talk to you about the details of that because it's absolutely fascinating. Um, they crashed more often than they landed safely. Um, the aircraft were so unsteady and unstable and almost unflyable, and they didn't know how to train you to be a pilot at that time. I mean, the guys who flew kind of did it by instinct, and they didn't really have any way to teach another person to fly, because how do you teach instinct? It, um, just probably my favorite example from flying in that period of 1915, 1916, is that they didn't know how to get out of flat spin. So you put an aircraft into a flat spin, and, and now it's pretty easy. How do, how do you get out of a flat spin? Kick the rudder over and increase power, something like that. It's sort of a, something they teach every uh, fledgling pilot today in, in the early days of their flying training. But at the time, if you went into a flat spin, you were dead, because the plane would just kind of spin around flat and pancake into the ground, and uh, that's the end of your, uh, your career. So that, that the idea of aviation was so new at the time that I think we sometimes forget that in these days of being able to fly anywhere in the world on a, a moment's notice and we kind of take the idea of air travel for granted, but this is really um, basic days. Once Kalashaw was through his flying training, he was sent over to France and his first unit was uh, number three naval wing. And like I said, I'm, I'm interested in Kalashaw's career, but it's interesting how he kind of plays into the, the bigger stories that are going on. Naval, uh, Three Naval Wing was of interest because it was one of the first uh, organizations that was doing strategic bombing in the First World War. They were uh, up by the, the Swiss border and uh, they had um, bomber aircraft uh, sop with one and a half strutters and fighter aircraft sop with one and a half strutters. It seems kind of a contradiction to be using the same plane for fighting and bombing, but that was what the, the British were doing at that time. Kalashaw probably uh, fortunately for his career, was put into one of the fighter uh, aircraft as opposed to one of the bomber aircraft. And uh, he did really well during that time um, in that he wasn't shot down and killed, um, which wasn't the case for all of his, his uh, comrades. Um, his adventures always seemed to, to go right for him. He seemed to be a man who had nine lives. Um, at one point early on in his flying career when he probably didn't know um, really how to handle the aircraft very well. He was asked to uh, ferry a, a SOP with one and a half strutter from one base to another and uh, he was happy to do it. He thought it was just a, a milk run so he didn't take his gunner with him 
And he also decided that he was going to go the, the quickest way, which was from point A to point B, straight line, right across the front lines, instead of taking a little bit of extra time to stay on the, sort of the safe side of the line. So he goes off <clears throat> and uh, gets over the lines, and he's promptly jumped by six German aircraft. And uh, early on in the engagement, a bullet goes through his windshield, um, powders the glass, uh, goes into his eyes, and he can't see. That's kind of important for a pilot at that time. By all rights, he should have been shot down and killed at that point, but somehow he managed to survive. He uh, flung the aircraft around, evaded the Germans, um, at one point went solo to the ground and, and did something incredibly stupid to the point where the German tried to uh, copy it and uh, killed himself by flying into the ground. Um, he managed to shake off the Germans and uh, get away. Um, he couldn't really see at this point. He only knew to fly west by flying into the sun. Um, so he did that. At one point he got over an air base. He thought he was safe. He put down. He landed. was about to shut down the engines. And he thought, hey, you know what, these aircraft look a little funny. Uh, managed to squint through his eyes and see that there was iron crosses on the wings. So he landed at a German air base. Luckily he hadn't shut down his engine. Took off, got away, even though they sent some guys up after him. And uh, eventually, he managed to come down at a, a French air base and, and survived. How, I don't know, but he did. And uh, that's, that's kind of a common story. I think um, I've counted at least four times during the war that he was shot down and crashed, uh, but managed to, uh, to walk away from it. And that doesn't even count the number of times that he uh, crashed a machine in training or crashed it due to mechanical issues or something like that. It was just normal to write off aircraft. Um, it wasn't normal to survive the way he did, but somehow he managed to keep getting away with it. Um, I love this painting. I actually uh, came across it a few weeks ago, and I thought, I need this in my den. So I tried to track down a print and found out that there's none left anywhere. I contacted the artist even, and he said, sorry, I don't have any left. So I'm really sad about that. But this shows um, Kalashaw during his Naval 10 days. This was the period when he was flying the Sopwith triplane, um, one of the outstanding fighters of the war, um, had three wings, it climbed very fast, it had good power for the day, it was very maneuverable, and uh, Kalashaw was able to, to put that into very good use. Um, from a period of about um, June to November of 1917, he flew in Naval 10 in a, a subsection called um, uh, B Flight, or uh, the Black Flight, um, that came from the fact that all the aircraft in his flight had black cowlings to dis um, distinguish them. He named his uh, aircraft Black Mariah, and uh, sort of a funny aside, I'd always called it Black Maria, because Maria is that's how we say it in this country. And uh, I uh, came across a recording of, of Kalashaw that was made in the just before his death, sort of in the early 70s, and he was talking about that period, and he called his plane Black Mariah. And I'm like, wow, this was just sort of like one of those uh, eureka moments. I mean, it's not a, a big deal. Nobody else is going to, to worry about that. But he called it Black Mariah, so we'll, we'll call it Black Mariah from here on in. But during this period, uh, B-Flight was mostly uh, Canadians. And uh, over a period of a, a very short time, they were shooting down Germans left, right, and center. Uh, 87 German aircraft um, during their, their very uh, active period which made them probably the highest scoring subunit in all the British flying services at that point, and, and Kalashaw racked up a very high score. Um, from my point of view, I find his, his time in number 203 squadron um, even more interesting. Sorry, it's Naval 3, um, just sort of a side history lesson. The Royal Flying Corps uh, joined with the Royal Naval Air Service on the 1st of April 1918 to become the Royal Air Force and uh, sort of the, the flying services were united. The Royal Naval Air Service squadrons, which had been called Naval 3, Naval 4, etc., cetera, uh, all became 200 series squadrons. So Naval 3 became 203 squadron. And, and that picture in, in particular is uh, really um, symbolic of, of that period. Can anybody pick out Kalashaw in there? Sorry? He's right in the center. He's the smiling guy in the naval officer's uniform with the, the white cap on. Still looks like a boy, but at this point he's the commanding officer of uh, 203 Squadron. And if you look at the uniforms in that picture, you see a mix of 
uh, Royal Flying Corps. On the, the far left, the, the guy in the top left is wearing uh, that maternity style jacket that the Royal Flying Corps wore. Uh, most of them are wearing the new Royal Air Force uniforms, but Kalasha is still wearing his naval officer's uniform from his time in the, the Royal Naval Air Service. But uh, for most of 1918, Kalasha was in command of the squadron. He um, was, was particularly effective during this period. The fact that he commanded a squadron from January 1918 right through until uh, September of 1918 is, is quite remarkable. Most guys didn't last that long in command of squadrons on the Western Front, um, but he did and he reigned, remained effective for most of the time. It's also interesting, um, Billy Bishop is, is the other big Canadian flyer that everybody knows something about, and Bishop was a, an absolutely outstanding flyer, credited with 72 kills on the Western Front, um, by all accounts an exceptional flyer, um, had great uh, eyes, could pick out enemy aircraft when uh, nobody else could see anything in the sky. Um, but Bishop, Bishop was a great flyer and a, a, a hunter, a killer, but when they made him a squadron commander, he wasn't very effective. Um, his time as a, a commander wasn't very good, and his subsequent career as a, in, in the military wasn't um, anything to talk about. He came back in the Second World War as a, an Air Vice Marshal, but it was mostly for uh, promotional purposes, for recruitment and, and morale issues. Um, Kalashaw was arguably as good a flyer, as good a fighter as uh, Bishop, but he also had that command ability, and he demonstrated that at various levels, um, commanding uh, B flight in Naval 10, uh, commanding number 203 squadron for most of 1918, uh, and we'll talk about his, his interwar and Second World War career where he held uh, succeedingly higher uh, commands. Like I'd said, Kalashaw's real big achievement in the First World War, as far as I'm concerned, is his ability to use um, Air Force Squadron, his Air Force Squadron, in close support work. Um, the air-to-air -air battle was absolutely crucial. We could spend uh, an entire night talking about um, what the Royal Flying Corps and, and the Royal Air Force were doing, doing uh, during the First World War, why the, the Knights of the Sky were so important, but that it was really the aerial reconnaissance and the artillery spotting aircraft that were doing uh, the yeoman's work over the Western Front, and those um, uh, sort of famous flyers were doing nothing more than protecting the important part of the Air Force, but we'll, we'll save that for, for another day. Um, the air-to-ground battle was, was another big part of the air war in the First World War that was just starting um, to become apparent by 1917 and then into 1918. The impact that the Air Force could have on supporting the ground battle. They weren't a, um, the Air Force wasn't uh, changing outcomes at that point. I'm not sure they ever do. Um, once again, that's a, a discussion for another day. But they were having a very important impact on how well the battle went, making it easier for the Army to advance to uh, cover their aspects to deal with reinforcements and things like that. And it all really came together for the first time in, in the Battle of Amiens. Um, during the Battle of Arras, Vimy Ridge in 1917, the, uh, the RFC had shown inklings of what they were able to do, but it was really at Amiens that they were first able to do it. I like to show this series of maps in respect to talking about Amiens because I think it really shows a perspective that um, puts, uh, lets us understand better what the Air Force was doing. So if anybody's ever read about the Battle of Amiens or studied it, you've probably seen this map, which comes from uh, um, Jerry Nicholson's uh, Canadian Expeditionary Force, the uh, official history of the battle. And it shows the Canadian Corps' battle at Amiens, that slice going down between the, the two roads, advancing eight miles um, during the course of the, the first day of the battle, an absolutely unheard of advance in the history of the First World War, quite a remarkable battle, really one of the, the great accomplishments of General Curry, this guy right here, and uh, the Canadian Corps. But this isn't the Battle of Amiens. If you talk to the Australians who uh, had their corps attacking on the left flank, the left-hand side of the Canadians, this is their map of Amiens, and it shows their slice. Where are the Canadians? Well, they're not there, they're to the south just like the Australians were to the north off their map. But if you really want to talk about the ground battle at Amiens, you really want to use that kind of a map, because there you can see in that sort of uh, solid hashing right down the center, 
is where the Canadian Corps was, the Australian Corps was to the north of that, but on either flank of the colonial troops were the, the British at the top and the French at the bottom. So it wasn't just a Canadian battle, it wasn't just an Australian battle, it was really an allied battle and uh, quite a bit more than any one corps on its own. But once again, this is just the ground view. And, uh, well, sorry, there's the, the Canadian slice, there's the Australian slice. And if you want to look at the, the complete battle, you want to look at this map, because this is the Air Force map of the Battle of Amiens. It's not just where the armies were fighting. Um, if you look to the, the far right, there's some uh, dotted lines, uh, sorry, sort of crosses marking lines. Those were uh, patrol lines that the Royal Air Force was flying to protect the battle space. So they were flying line patrols along those areas to ensure that the German Air Force didn't um, come into the battle area and do anything. All those red dots you see were targets that the RAF was bombing during the battle. Um, they were bombing bridges, they were bombing crossroads, they were bombing uh, road junctions as an attempt to slow down the arrival of reinforcements into the battle space to prevent the Germans from bringing reinforcements to the front to support the battle and to isolate the battlefield. They were attacking bridges. Now, arguably the attacks on the bridges weren't very successful, but they had the right idea in terms of trying to control the battle space. And uh, it really is, um, in many ways, the first thoroughly modern and comprehensive application of air power on, uh, on the battlefield. And, um, I like to talk about this battle because it really sets the model for what we consider um, uh, air power today. You really have all aspects of air power that you have going today in the Canadian Air Force, in the United States Air Force. Any modern Air Force today does all these things. Preparations for the battle. The RAF, uh, the night before the battle, was flying uh, big lumbering two-engine bombers over the battlefield to uh, drown out the sound of the tanks that were moving forward. Um, you have artillery cooperation, you have army cooperation. Uh, during the battle, aircraft were trying to resupply the troops moving forward. Mobile warfare was tough for um, the forces on the Western Front in 1918. So they had aircraft that were doing resupply, dropping ammunition, uh, dropping water, dropping supplies to uh, ensure that the troops could keep their forward movement going. Uh, reconnaissance, trench strafing is what we think of as close air support today. Uh, air superiority, making sure they dominated the battle space, interdiction, preventing both the German uh, Air Force as well as the German Army from moving into the area, um, attacking aerodromes. The best way to suppress an enemy Air Force is not to engage them in battle in the air, but to hit them on their airfield so they can never take off. And then supply, as I mentioned. And all those were taking place at Amiens, and Kalasha was, was really right in the middle of it. His, uh, his autobiography is really strong on this, and he said that uh, during the course of the 8th of August, the first day of the battle, he was in the air for about 10 hours during the day, which is really quite crazy. Um, and he said that for the vast majority of that, he was flying at uh, an altitude of 100 feet or below. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it gives you an indication of the kind of thing he's doing. Um, the one thing that's worth mentioning, though, is the cost of that. Um, by the end of the day, his squadron had lost four aircraft and four pilots. And uh, within the next few days, his squadron was cut in half in terms of its effective strength by losses. Air forces can do close air support, but it's costly. Uh, it's, it was costly in the First World War. It was costly in the Second World War. And uh, in, in sort of lieu of sort of a low uh, threat environment that we have today in a lot of the battlefields we fight in, close air support is very costly when the enemy has any kind of ability to, uh, to fight back. Kalashaw talks about flying over the battlefield and he actually called it the graveyard of the Air Force because he said he couldn't fly any more than a, a few minutes without seeing the wreck of another uh, British aircraft uh, that had plowed into uh, the battlefield. So the First World War ended for Kalashaw um, with him doing mostly close air support. I think that uh, in going through his, um, his logbook for most of 1918 at least a third and probably close to a half of the sorties that he flew during that period were doing close air support work. And um, it, it, it's really important in understanding the man because he became one of the first specialists in close air support in uh, the Royal Air Force. He wasn't the only one, 
but that was his specialty and it was something that would uh, inform his his decision making uh, later on in his career. His uh, post-war, uh, early post-war career um, wasn't uh, easy. He didn't just sort of uh, end the war and go home and uh, sort of raise a family or anything like that. He uh, he stayed in the RAF. He was one of the, the lucky few that was offered a permanent commission in the Royal Air Force rather than being cashiered like the vast majority of the men in the in the RAF. And uh, the first thing that he was uh, offered to do was to go to South Russia during the Russian Civil War and command number 47 squadron. And uh, his biography, which is pretty thin on some areas, the, the largest single chapter in the entire book is about his time in, in South Russia. And I think you could uh, sell this as a screenplay to somebody in Hollywood and it would be one of the, the greatest uh, adventure movies of, of all time because they're flying around the, the steppes of Russia, they're uh, going up in their aircraft and they're uh, machine gunning, um, attacking cavalry who are waving uh, swords at them and as their only defense. They're bombing the, the czars or the communist armies uh, uh, that are trying to move on boats on the Volga River um, in what we now know as Stalingrad or Volgograd. Um, there's uh, tra uh, chases and armored trains uh, towards the end of, of the war when things are going south for the, the white armies uh, that the British are supporting. They're uh, trying to evacuate and they've got their armored train and uh, they're being traced by a, a Red Army train that's got a cannon on the front and they managed to stay just far enough ahead of it and the Red Army train's about to fire and they go around a bend and they can't turn the cannon and stuff. It's just crazy stuff. Um, at one point, um, Kuleshaw comes down with um, typhoid. Um, he's out on a mission by himself and that's when it hits him and he has to land and he can't do anything. Some local villagers rescue him and he ends up spending probably about two and a half or three months with this uh, Russian nurse who basically nurses him back to health. The whole time his men are thinking that he's dead, lost, captured, whatever, gone. And uh, eventually he makes his way back and everything's good. Just crazy stories. But once again, he's a man who seems to have nine lives and, and sort of survives from all of it. Um, after that, he goes to Iraq where he's uh, fighting the Bolsheviks. In uh, Kurdistan, it's one of his more interesting um, assignments as far as I'm concerned because he has made the uh, air liaison officer with a, a ground task force that's advancing on, on some of the uh, tribes that they're, they're trying to subjugate and spends uh, a few months on horseback with this uh, expedition going through the mountains, um, liaising with the RAF and while at uh, Amiens and in the hundred days he had this perspective of air warfare from the air. Now he's got a perspective of air warfare from the ground, from the back of a horse and I think it was a really important part of his career development to do that. Um, he does the normal stuff for officers, commands a couple of squadrons in uh, England, uh, goes to RAF Staff College. He's, uh, Staff College is new uh, right after the First World War. He's on the third course of it and uh, it's uh, really an important stone um, in his career progression. I think it's worth putting a face on the man that uh, he did get married. Um, his wife was from uh, British Columbia. He met her in the, the fall of, of 1917. And what I find absolutely remarkable about this is that he was, uh, after his time in Naval 10, he was sent home on leave. And he proceeded to make his way across the country um, by train, stopping in a whole bunch of different towns, mostly to talk to the families of uh, men that he knew that had been killed, to uh, share some uh, stories about these guys and make sure they weren't forgotten. And uh, one of his stops was with uh, the Trapp family. Um, one of his great friends on uh, Naval 10 had been a, a guy named George Trapp, who uh, had unfortunately been shot down and killed. And so he stopped to, to talk to the Trapp family. And while he was there, he kind of was smitten with uh, his, her, her, uh, his sister, uh, Juanita, who uh, went by Nieta. And uh, they kind of fell in love. And I, I really can't figure her out because either she's the most forgiving woman in the world or Kalasha had a charm that uh, would, would sink ships because not only was George killed in the flying services, um, their brother Stanley was killed while Kalashaw was in Canada wooing the sister. 
and uh, a third brother was also killed flying uh, with the Royal Flying Corps. So Nieta lost three brothers in the flying services, yet she committed herself to a man who was a flyer. I don't know if there's an insanity there or, or what, um, but uh, something clicked between them and uh, they started to correspond. They uh, made the decision not to get married while Kalashaw was sort of off living his uh, officer lifestyle in South Russia and everything like that. And it wasn't until the, the summer of 1924 that they finally got married. So that was a long time for her to like change her decision and realize, what am I doing with this, this guy? But she never changed her mind and uh, it was sort of one of those um, glorious love stories. They ended up having two daughters, uh, Mary and, and Felicity, that were born in uh, uh, I think 24 and 25 and uh, were entirely devoted to him. So I think it's really quite a, a remarkable story. The Royal Navy um, started to investigate aircraft in, in the First World War. Um, aircraft were becoming more important. It was seen the, the value they could have as reconnaissance aircraft. So the Navy said, well, this would be helpful. So we need to do something about this. So they made uh, early attempts in, in 1917 and 1918 to create aircraft carriers, which were mostly just converted uh, other ships with flat decks or partial decks or catapults or something. But by the, the 19, uh, late 1920s and into the 30s, this idea of the aircraft carrier had really uh, come into its own and uh, they were building dedicated ships, although this one, the HMS Courageous, was a, a converted cruiser that had its superstructure taken off and a flight deck put on. But in uh, 1929, Kalashaw was assigned to command the air wing on uh, Courageous. And, and that, it's kind of an interesting story because the Navy didn't have its own air force at that point. I mean, obviously there had been the Royal Naval Air Service during the First World War, but it was just the Royal Air Force at this point. So we have Royal Air Force aircraft flying off Royal Naval character, uh, aircraft carriers. And it made for kind of a, a curious situation. One commentator at the time said that it was like the, uh, the Royal Navy was a, a taxi service for the Royal Air Force. And Kalashaw himself was in a very difficult position because he's commander of the air wing, um, some 30, 35 aircraft and hundreds of men, but he's also subjected to naval discipline. Um, he was a, a very aggressive man by nature. He saw the way that aircraft could be used in, a, in an offensive method and thought that you could use torpedoes and, and bombs in a way to uh, deal with the enemy fleet. Well, the Navy wanted to have no part of that. The Navy thought that the battleship, the big gun, was the, the reason for having navies. Aircraft were useful in reconnaissance and spotting. And yeah, we've got some tor uh, torpedo aircraft, but they can they can just go and fire their torpedoes and, and maybe they'll hit something and slow down the uh, the enemy fleet so that the, the big guns of the battleships can get in and, and do the, the real job of, of knocking them out. So it was a real kind of a funny period in, in the development of um, uh, naval aviation. But Kalashaw was, was right there at the center. He was on the Courageous for three years. And it uh, gave him a sense of um, uh, sort of inter-service uh, relationships. How do you deal with another service? Um, how do you relate to them when you don't really agree? How do you get along um, when really you just want to tell them to, well, I won't say it because we're in polite company. So it was a, a really important learning point in his uh, career. Um, soon after he joined Courageous, the fighting had broken out in, um, in, in Beirut and uh, uh, in the Middle East. And uh, the Courageous was dispatched to uh, lend support to the aircraft. This was a, a period where it was thought that aircraft could impose their will on people on the ground just by flying over, by machine gunning them. Um, the British had had a lot of success with that in, in Persia and in India and in places like that and it thought, why not use it in the Middle East? Well, it failed absolutely miserably. The Royal Air Force units that were on the ground there already would go in and start machine gunning people and, I mean, how well can you tell friend from foe from the air? Well, you really can't and it wasn't very successful. Um, Kalashaw was asked to commit his air wing and he took them in, but he did realize this and he was much more cautious in their employment. He uh, ordered his troops not to fire unless they were absolutely certain that uh, the, the people on the ground were hostile. And uh, there was a real great anecdote that I thought really summed it up that uh, 
you come across a, a burning place and you want to go and attack them because you see people uh, running out of the, the burning house, but do you know if they're bandits that are pillaging the place or are they neighbors that are trying to rescue things um, from the house before it burns down? And that really caught the, the conundrum of understanding what's going from the air. And so Kalashat was really uh, instrumental in providing uh, intelligence and reconnaissance and some uh, firepower to supporting the British forces there, but it didn't really change anything as we know from a hundred years of history in the Middle East that things are still not terribly smooth over there. Um, so that brings us to the Second World War, to uh, what I think is in many ways the, the prime part of his, his career, and I think he agrees with that as well. Kalashaw, after the, uh, his appointment on the uh, Courageous, had gone to, back to England, and he was subsequently posted over to Sudan during the Abyssinia crisis. He was all set to go to war with Italy if uh, it was so needed, but luckily cooler heads prevailed and it didn't happen. Because he was over there, he was posted to a command in Egypt and uh, in 38 and 39, uh, he actually brought his family over to live just outside of Cairo. And in his memoirs, he called it probably the most idyllic uh, period in my entire service career. He said it was peacetime, they were living in Egypt, which was beautiful, his family was there and uh, everyone was happy, but then the Second World War broke out and Kalashaw found himself as the senior um, uh, RAF operational commander during the early battles against the Italians and, and then the Germans. Um, without getting too much into detail about what the fighting uh, was, was taking place over there, but uh, essentially the war had broken out in September 1939 uh, with the uh, attack on Poland, and then there was the sort of the famous Sitzkrieg um, in France, Germany, uh, declined to attack right away and it wasn't until May 1940 when they finally attacked and this whole time it's just sort of a tension that's taking place in in the western desert the British in the western desert aren't really concerned about uh, the Germans they're more concerned about the Italians um, Mussolini had it in his mind that he wanted to create this new Roman Empire that was behind his uh, move in the Abyssinia crisis and he saw the, the start of the Second World War as a really as a, an opportunity to create that uh, Roman Empire, to carve uh, his territory out of uh, the British and French empires that were in North Africa. So with the start of the, the Second World War, Mussolini moved more forces into Libya, which was a, an Italian territory. But his, his real goal was Egypt. He wanted Cairo, he wanted the Nile Delta, and he especially wanted the Suez Canal. So the British weren't going to allow that to happen. But the British really didn't have a lot there because the focus of their war wasn't on the Middle East. It was on not losing Britain. It was on the fighting in France, the Battle of France 1940. It was on the Battle of Britain. It was uh, thinking about what the Japanese were going to do even though things hadn't really broken out there much. And uh, the Italians were using this to their advantage. By um, sort of the late fall of, of 1940, the disparity in forces in, the, in North Africa was absolutely ridiculous. The uh, Italians had a four or five to one advantage in men on the ground, uh, even bigger advantage in aircraft, and they also had uh, almost internal lines of supply. They could just sort of jump across the Mediterranean for supplies, for reinforcements, for replacement aircraft, things like that, whereas the, the British had to bring stuff from all the way from the UK and uh, eventually the Italians were able to shut down the Mediterranean. So it became very difficult to supply the British Army and, and the Air Force, especially in Egypt. Uh, some of the, the bigger twin-engine aircraft could fly um, from the UK to Gibraltar to Malta and then to Egypt, but uh, the single-engine fighters didn't have the range to do that. So they had to uh, be innovative and they came up with uh, something they called the Takarati route. So they would uh, box up the aircraft, they would sail to West Africa, um, unload them at a, a port called Takarati, uh, rebuild them, and then they would fly them across the entire width of Africa. They had a series of airfields built up with uh, supply points um, into the Sudan and then fly them up the Nile River Valley into Egypt. Absolutely crazy uh, route, but it was the only way they could get fresh aircraft and supplies. Obviously they lost a lot of aircraft along the way, but they were able to get reinforcements up at a, a time when it really mattered. 
So the Italians finally decided that it was time to attack. So in uh, September 1940, they launched their attack. Uh, the British thought they were going for Cairo, but they really only just came into uh, the far western regions of Egypt, and then they stopped. And the British couldn't figure out why they were going to stop. So um, the British looked at it as a, an opportunity. They knew they were outmanned. They knew they were outgunned. But uh, they thought that by bluster and, and bold initiative, they might be able to, to get somewhere. So um, Richard O'Connor, who was the, the British general on the ground, came up with this plan known as Operation Compass. And they attacked the, uh, the Italians. And initially, it was meant to be a limited attack just to capture those camps. You can see the uh, it's Tumar and Nibuai and Rabia. Those were the, the right in the center of the map that uh, the Italians had built in the middle of the desert. They thought, we'll capture those and then we'll see what happens. Well, what happened was that the Italians panicked and they ran and they surrendered in a, a way that the British never expected. So they said, yeah, you know what, this is going well, let's keep going. So uh, they kept going, they got to uh, uh, the Halfaya Pass, Fort Capuzzo on the uh, extreme left. By uh, early uh, January 1941, they were at Berdia and uh, they kept going and uh, I'll show you the, the map for the rest of the operation. It was a success beyond uh, belief and a lot of the success had to do with Kalashaw who was supplying the air forces that were uh, supporting the British Army during this adventure. The uh, Kalashaw from his time in the Western Debt, sorry, in the Western Front and the interwar years knew that to fly um, combat air patrols, air umbrellas over the Army to protect them was an absolute waste of air power. You can fly circles in the sky and all you're doing is being defensive. You're not contributing anything to the offensive goals of your army. And even worse, you're wasting flight hours, you're wasting fuel, and you're really exposed to attacks. But that's what the Italian Air Force did during all these battles. The uh, Italian generals knew that um, they had the upper hand, that they could tell the uh, Italian Air Force what to do, and they said, we don't want to be attacked by the, uh, the Royal Air Force. You're going to fly air umbrellas over us all the time. And so they did. And Kalashaw took advantage of that. It meant that, uh, well, maybe they couldn't attack those enemy uh, units right there while the uh, air umbrella wasn't there. But there was lots of places the uh, uh, Italian Air Force wasn't. And they went there and they attacked. Um, one of my favorite stories from this period is uh, the, the use of the, the one hurricane. Most of the aircraft the British had at this point were sort of um, not quite World War I cast-offs, but not too far from it. The Gloucester Gladiator was uh, the last uh, biplane fighter in the Royal Air Force, and it was the main fighter that Kalashaw had at his disposal. But he had one hurricane, and uh, one hurricane only. And the hurricane was a pretty good aircraft to begin with, but in the Western Desert, it was exceptional because the main fighter the Italians had was also a, uh, a biplane, the CR-42. So this one hurricane was dubbed uh, Colley's Battleship because uh, he didn't want the Italians to know he only had one. So it was flown all the time by a succession of pilots. It was used at different places, different times. Uh, different markings were applied to keep the, uh, the Italians guessing. And it was used in a very offensive method. Um, he also took two uh, Blenheim bombers. It's a twin engine uh, early war bomber. Uh, relatively fast for its time, but strictly a bomber but they uh, put machine guns on it and turned it into a sort of a twin engine fighter. So they'd have two of the Blenheim fighters with uh, Colley's battleship and they would attack these formations of uh, Italian fighters and absolutely decimate them and scare the bejesus out of them. And uh, they became defensive because of it and they really gained the initiative during this period. And so for the entire period of Compass, uh, Kalashaw was able to do what he knew was the right thing to do with air power, which was to attack the means of the army to fight the battle. Uh, attack the ports, attack the transportation lines, um, attack the uh, motor convoys, and not worry about these air umbrellas over the German front line or the Italian front line troops because that was the least profitable target of all and not a lot of gain would be made in having that. So the, uh, the effect of the, the aggressiveness O'Connor combined with the uh, sort of the force multiplier that was provided by the Air Force really made the difference in, in, in compass. Um, the Battle at Bardia is, is one of the, the hallmarks for this campaign as far as I'm concerned because it was a, a really tough nut to crack. There was uh, 110,000 uh, Italian troops that were garrisoning this position. Um, the British attacked it with two Australian brigades, so about 10,000 men. 
So you can do the math there. It's uh, pretty much in, in the Italians' favor. But the Allies used a uh, combined arms warfare. They brought the Navy in. Um, the Navy uh, used their big guns. This is battleships, cruisers, um, firepower that isn't too far off what the Allies were using off uh, Normandy on D-Day to uh, pound the Italian uh, positions. And uh, Kalashaw was using his, his aircraft very aggressively as well to attack uh, Italian frontline positions, to maintain a, a patrol line to prevent the Italian Air Force from interfering, um, to attack the other ports to assure that uh, A, the, the Italians couldn't escape and B, they couldn't be reinforced. And over the course of uh, January 3rd to the 5th, they uh, captured uh, Bardia for very low losses and huge bags of prisoners. There's a great account in one of the, the war diaries of a, a, a British regiment that was fighting during this period. And uh, they were asked about how many Italian uh, prisoners they caught. And they said, well, we don't really have a number, but there's about nine acres of them, kind of thing. So yeah, they couldn't count them, but they could tell how much ground they carried. So that's pretty substantial. So Compass continued. The British had no intention of going all the way to uh, Benghazi and uh, during this period, but the Italians let them. They, uh, they kept running. Um, they kept up a, a pretty good rear defense, but the British and there was Australian and, and Indian troops um, during this period wouldn't let them catch their breath, kept harassing them. Kalashaw made sure that reinforcements couldn't uh, come in. Uh, one of the, the great um, indicators of, of success for me during this campaign was that uh, the Italians abandoned hundreds, if not a thousand aircraft on their airfields um, during this retreat because they couldn't get them off in time. They uh, were close to their supply dumps. Uh, Italy wasn't very far away, but these aircraft had broken down. Maybe they'd uh, had a hole shot in a tire or a radiator or something like that, mostly minor fixes but they weren't able to deal with those repairs and get those aircraft evacuated, so they, they lost most of their air force because it was not necessarily destroyed in the air or bombed on the ground, but because it was out of uh, commission and, and couldn't be evacuated. So an absolutely remarkable uh, campaign, uh, really the first major British victory in the war, one that's not thought about too often anymore. Something that gets me really angry is that those who do mention it say, oh well, it was against the Italians. Um, like it was some kind of a second-class victory. And uh, if you read the accounts of what was happening on the ground, it's very clear that the Italians, um, sure, they had their problems, but they were very combat effective when they chose to be, and it wasn't just a walk over the entire time. The British won because of their tactics, because of their audacity, um, because of their, their boldness of tactics, because of their use of the Air Force, and it wasn't just because it was, oh, the Italians that have... Uh, a tank that has one forward gear and three reverse gears or, or something like that. You've heard all the jokes. <clears throat> it's uh, just a bunch of pictures showing the, the hurricanes in the top left corner. Um, by the, the time of Compass, the British had more hurricanes and they were a, a very effective aircraft for them. Um, you can see a couple pictures with uh, destroyed Italian aircraft on the ground. It's, as well as a big line of Italian prisoners that were captured during the battles. Um, battle Axe is, to my mind, one of the most important battles in the Western Desert, not because it was a British failure, um, not because um, it, it was a battle that was designed to sort of keep the, the British offensive going. This has come after the, the Germans have come into the war, after the Germans have pushed the, the British out of Cyrenaica, and the British are trying to uh, regain the momentum. Uh, Tobruk had been isolated and turned into a, um, a, a isolated garrison that the Germans hadn't been able to capture, and Operation Battle Axe was mainly geared to try to, to relieve uh, Tobruk. And uh, the battle went wrong for a bunch of reasons. The British uh, had changed commands. O'Connor had been captured, and became an Italian prisoner of war during the, the German offensive in, in March and April 1941. So there was new generals coming in. These were guys who thought they knew what they were doing when they really didn't. Um, and the one thing that these new crop of generals didn't do that O'Connor had done so well was that O'Connor had got along with his Air Force commander, with Kalashaw. They had talked regularly. They had their um, headquarters co-located. They consulted on their plans. and. O'Connor knew that 
the Air Force had a role to play. And he also knew he didn't know how to run the Air Force, so he listened to Collishaw to say, well, this is how we should do things. Um, the new British commanders that were brought in, uh, Beresford Pierce in particular, thought that he knew how things go. He thought that the Air Force really wasn't a separate service. It was really just a, another weapon in his arsenal, not much different than the, uh, the artillery. And uh, he was kind of of the opinion that if I can't see what the Air Force is doing, then it may as well not be doing anything at all because it's not helping me. So they thought that the Air Force needs to be flying air umbrellas, uh, which was ordered during battle acts, and we know how well those worked for the Italians, and that the idea of interdiction was just a waste because it's not doing anything to impact me on the, the actual uh, battlefield where the, the war is being fought, which is completely wrong. So for the first three days of, of Operation Battle Axe, the uh, RAF and, and Kalashaw were ordered to listen to the Army and do what uh, the Army was ordering it to do. Um, Air Marshal Arthur Tedder, who would go on to be one of the, the great uh, British commanders of the, the Second World War, really didn't have a clue of what he was doing at this point. Or, or maybe he did. I'm, I'm not sure about that, and I'll explain in a second. Um, but he um, agreed to, to do what the Army did, so he ordered Kalashaw to fly air combat patrols, not to act aggressively, and as a result, the Germans were given the initiative during this battle. So even though the British made uh, initial headway on the ground, the Germans were able to reinforce very quickly without interference from the RAF and bring new battle, uh, new uh, panzer units to the battle and turn the course of the battle, stop the uh, uh, British advance, and uh, came very close to uh, actually destroying the entire British force by surrounding it. And I would argue that um, by the, the third and fourth day of the battle, when it was realized that the RAF wasn't being as effective, when orders came from London to release the hounds, so to speak, when Kalashaw was allowed to fly the battle plan that he wanted to fly, that he was able to go do interdiction and uh, materially impact the ability of the Germans to move on the battlefield and stop them from surrounding the, the British forces as they went to escape from the battlefield. Um, it's just sort of a uh, sort of a summary of what I've just been talking about. Um, the reason why I think battle axe is so important is because it showed to Churchill the importance of the Air Force in the ground battle and made him realize that the Air Force has to be allowed to fight its own battle in support of the Army, not its own independent battle, but that the Army couldn't be superior to the Air Force in terms of orders and taskings. Um, on the 6th of July, um, Churchill before this had come out and he'd said a, a bunch of things, but it was very clear that he was supporting the Army view of, of the use of air power, that the Army must be supported by the Air Force, the uh, Air Force must do what the Army needs it to do. Uh, the Army had been let down by the Air Force during the Battle of France and we can't allow that to happen anymore. All of a sudden, Battle Axe happens, he realizes what had went right and what had went wrong and realized that the RAF way of doing things was the right way. And he did a, a complete 180 in his thinking. And you can see the, the start of it here on his statement on the 6th of uh, July. And uh, just a couple months later, he's making uh, one of his um, command statements that uh, really changed um, the way that air power was viewed, I would argue, for the rest of the war. Nevermore must the ground troops expect, as a matter of course, to be protected against the air by aircraft. No more air umbrellas is what he's saying. And uh, he's saying standing patrols can't be allowed and it's unsound to distribute aircraft in this way. Um, and he's basically saying that, uh, even though Kalashaw never gets mentioned, that Kalashaw's way of conducting an air battle is the right way to do it and going forward, this is what we need to do. Why don't we know about Kalashaw? Why isn't Kalashaw the father of modern tactical air support or the guy who's given credit for all this? Well, there's a, a couple big reasons. Um, Tedder hated Kalashaw. And uh, I haven't been able to, to figure it out exactly why, but uh, Tedder arrives in uh, Egypt in December 1940. He's brought in as a, uh, a support for uh, Arthur Longmore, who's the air commander in the, the Middle East because Longmore's got too many responsibilities, he needs a deputy, they bring in Tedder. Tedder was actually the second choice. Um, Air Marshal, is it Boyd? I think Air Marshal Boyd was the, 
first choice to come in and do that. In his aircraft, something happened and he ended up crash landing on Sicily. Well, he's a prisoner of war, so they sent out their second choice, which was uh, Tedder. And uh, it, it's very clear from Tedder's letters that uh, he disliked uh, Kalashaw right from the start. So there was some pre-existing something going on there, and I've never found the exact smoking gun, but I, I'd be willing to bet that um, Tedder was kind of a um, academic, quiet, reserved type, uh, didn't smoke, didn't really drink, liked to keep to himself. Uh, Kalsha was the life of the party. Um, he was a guy who liked to have a good time. He was the last guy to leave the mess every night. Um, he was loud, he was brash, he's a fighter pilot. And uh, I think that probably at some point, Kalsha did something that offended Tedder. Um, and I mean, I can go through the, their, their postings in the interwar period, and they crossed paths numerous times, and I'm sure it was something like that, but Tedder didn't like Kalashaw, and from the time he was there, he was working to get rid of him. Um, Tedder's decision to support the army um, during Operation Battle Axe can be seen in one of two ways. Uh, one is that he really didn't know what he was doing yet and was still learning, and wasn't uh, knowledgeable enough or secure enough in his position to stand up to the army, which is a, a pretty big condemnation of it. Or, and I'm not sure if this is better, he was a, a bit of a, a fox about it, and he knew exactly what he was doing, and he knew that the army was going to fail if uh, the Air Force was required to do this, but he did it anyway to prove a point to the army, to say, well, we did it your way, look how that turned out, now let's do it our way. So I'm not really sure which is the better interpretation for Tedder. None of them really paint him in a, uh, a great light. And uh, I'm very critical of, of Tedder during his time in the Western Desert. But like I said, uh, he did finally figure things out. Um, he became uh, a champion of, of close air support and, and tactical aviation. And uh, by the time of uh, the close of the North African campaign, Sicily, uh, into Italy, and then he was brought back to be the um, uh, deputy to Eisenhower during Operation Overlord. He was the deputy commander-in-chief and sort of the senior Air Force officer for the rest of the war. He'd, he'd figured things out and he became one of the more effective Air Force officers the British had, but that was then, early on, he, he wasn't quite there. Um, Tedder used battle axe as sort of the, the leverage to, to get Kalashaw sent away. Um, it's very clear the outcome of battle axe wasn't Kalashaw's fault but you have a failure and somebody has to, to take the, the, the fault for it and Kalashaw was the guy. Um, so he sent him back to England and that was essentially the end of Kalashaw's career. He uh, spent some time in fighter command headquarters. Um, he was then given command of uh, number 14 group which was up in the, the north of the, the UK and Scotland. Had a really important role to play during the, the Battle of Britain but by 1943 it was a backwater. It's where guys were sent to sort of be put out to pasture, fighter pilots were sent to recover, stuff like that. And uh, Kalashaw in his uh, diary, in his autobiography is very clear that he said, in 1943 I was retired. He didn't say I retired or I was ready to retire, he said I was retired. And that's all he says about it and I hate the fact that he didn't say anything more about that because his letters and writings are absolutely voluminous. Um, I've got hundreds if not thousands of letters that he wrote in the 40s, 50s, 60s, right into the 70s. He was uh, uh, sort of a amateur historian, wrote to anybody who was interested in, in talking to him, but he didn't say anything more about why he left the Air Force. He had some health problems at that point. He'd spent a couple of weeks in hospital, but I don't think that was the key. I think that he was just seen as surplus to the war effort. I think that. Uh, he wasn't that old. He was older for an Air Force commander, but he wasn't uh, older than any of his uh, sort of colleagues who were in similar positions. But I think they just thought that he had sort of done his job and, and didn't have anything more to contribute. Um, I think the fact that Tedder didn't like him played a big role in it. Tedder was a big up-and-comer in the RAF and uh, said uh, probably nasty things to him. Tedder, if you read his, um, his memoirs, they're called Without Prejudice. Um, and for the most part, they're written without prejudice. But if you read what he has to say about Kalashaw, he's really prejudiced. Uh, it was clear that whatever had happened during the war before it, he hadn't let it go. And he was still unhappy with, with Kalashaw. And he gave him both barrels in, in his memoirs, even though he doesn't discuss almost anybody 
don't think anybody else in that same way. Um, Kalashaw never fired back. He never said anything more. So, yeah, Kalashaw didn't have the support of Tedder. And I don't think he had a, a, a bigger patron in the Royal Air Force. Um, Tedder was really fortunate that Wilfred Freeman, who was one of the senior RAF commanders during the war, one of the most important guys uh, running things behind the scenes, had his back because there was a couple times during the war when Churchill was absolutely bound and determined to get rid of Tedder and Freeman and also uh, Portal, who was the chief of the air staff, stepped in and said, no, this guy Tedder is too important, we need him, you can back off. Um, Kalashaw didn't have that kind of support and so he was retired in 1943. Um, the other part of it is that after Kalashaw left, he was replaced by um, this guy, um, Air Vice Marshal Arthur Conningham, who was a, a New Zealander, uh, he was known by the nickname Mary, which was kind of a, a bastardization of Maori, sort of his New Zealand heritage. And in many ways, Cunningham was a twin of Kalashaw. He's also a First World War ace. Um, his brother was, um, uh, had climbed Mount Everest with uh, Sir Edmund Hillary. Um, he, had a, he was a great adventurous guy. He was loud, he was brash. He was the exact kind of person that Kalashaw was, but he got along with Tedder. And so he came in at a point where uh, Kalashaw had done a lot of the heavy lifting and, and really changed the way the Air Force was working in the, the Middle East. He came in, he changed some more things, um, but sort of from the time Conningham took over, the Air Force became very effective, very uh, good at doing close support work, and Conningham was given the credit of being sort of the creator of this allied system of air support. I would argue that Kalashaw had sort of developed 75% of it, passed the ball to Conningham, he kind of made it pretty and took all the credit for it. So Kalashaw gets forgotten. So I'll, I'll leave you with this quote again and uh, I think you can maybe see now why Kalashaw had found his, his time in the Western Desert as so important and the best part of his career. So I would say if he'd had big health problems, he would have died soon after the war, but he didn't. He lived until 1976. Um, most of the time after the war, he was a sort of a mining entrepreneur, um, doing mining for copper and gold and other things in the BC interior. As I mentioned, he was an amateur historian, uh, was really interested in the First World War. If you go through his papers at the, the National Archives in Ottawa, he has reams of papers on trying to conduct uh, put together squadron rosters, lists of aces. He was really interested in the question of who shot down the Red Baron um, for a while, um, maintained correspondence with every First World War flyer he could find, uh, wrote to historians in the 60s and 70s who were interested in his story. But it's almost all about his First World War career. Um, I think nobody was interested in his Second World War career, so he just kind of sort of left it alone. And that's the part that I really hate, because you've got all this evidence of his First World War career in his own handwriting, but very little about the Second World War, which is what I'm interested in. But I think, in many ways, I've kind of put together the story as well as we can, we can understand it today. And he's, he's an important man. He did a great job as a, a great war ace, as one of the Knights of the Air, but he was really, should be best known for his Second World War career. So, thank you very much. Sure. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Do you think his being a Canadian had anything to do with that tension between himself and Tedder? Sorry, I, I missed the first Being a Canadian. That's a really good question, and I would say no. Um, because the RAF at that point was a very metropolitan kind of organization. There was a lot of Canadians in the service, there were New Zealanders, there were South Africans, um, and I, I don't see any evidence that he was prejudiced because he was Canadian. I mean, he'd been RAF, he was R RAF royalty in a lot of ways, um, going back to the origins in the, in the First World War. He did his time, he'd been there, he'd done that, he had all the gongs to show for it. Um, so I, I think the fact that he was a Canadian had nothing to do with it. I mean, Conningham, who came over and replaced him, 
uh, was a New Zealander, and that obviously had no impact with, with Tedder. So, yeah, I don't think it was him being a Canadian. I think there were other factors that were involved. Yes? You made the mention of one hurricane. How many gladiators were there? Because I know they were able to hold multiple for a while with three of them. Faith, hope, and glory. Yeah. Um, they had, um, early on, sort of in uh, right at the start of the war, they had maybe a dozen, pushing two dozen fighters at the start. They had some uh, some bombers, but most of them were old clapped out things that they wouldn't even fly in England, let alone France. Um, but they could use them in the Middle East because there wasn't a lot of opposition. Um, there's a great story of um, Kalashaw using uh, the bomb bay, which was a twin engine transport, um, virtually unairworthy. Um, but he had no other option, and at some point they came across a big store of uh, old hand grenades and uh, decided to use them against the Italians. So they put a bunch of guys in the back of this bomb bay with the hand grenades, and of course with a hand grenade you got to pull the pin and drop it. So they had a couple of guys in the back of these bomb bays. They'd fly over the, the Italian camps at night and uh, uh, drop the, the hand grenades like that, and uh, you're, you're not going to cause any casualties you're going to be effective at destroying the morale of the Italians because there's this loud aircraft and explosions and you and I know the chance of anybody getting hit by those pieces of shrapnel or, or next to nil but when you're laying in your slit trench at night and hearing these explosions you're not sleeping and you're not going to be effective the next day so kind of another way that he uh, used the, the little that he had during that period. Back here and then over here. This is a question I want to be very careful by phrase because I don't want to imply more than that. That is a basic question. In most of it, in many of us World War One episodes, I see multiple versions. Details change. And to, I, I'm thinking of whether he did or did not shoot down the German aces. Carl Allen wrote her. He absolutely did not shoot him down. That's yeah. clear. And, and whether uh, he fell out of the cockpit of his airplane. I think there's a little of both. Um, I've been in contact with um, a guy named Mike Westrup, who's written a history of Naval 10 Squadron, and uh, he absolutely hates Kalashaw. He thinks he's a blowhard. He thinks he was so full of himself, uh, telling stories, and I think. Part of that, I think there's an element of truth to that, um, but I think there's an element that when you look at all the other guys and look at their stories and what they think of the big dog, there's kind of a skewed perspective in that as well. Um, if you read his, his memoirs very closely, it's clear that it doesn't line up 100% with um, sort of the actual historical record. Um, is there some elaboration? Absolutely. It's what I call the Legion effect. It's that kind of um, the way stories grow in importance in telling over time. Um, and Kalashaw wasn't immune to that. Um, but he had some great stories to tell. And I think he told his stories. And then whether he retold them to be bigger and better. Or also, I think there's also some people that were telling his stories for him and making them bigger and better than they were to begin with. There's certainly that aspect. Um, if you compare his memoirs to others um, who were writing at that time, it's clear that he's not the worst of the offenders. Um, but the, yeah, there's certainly that element there. Um, but for the most part, I think he can back up most of what he did. Um, there's, uh, I mean, uh, there's a lot of uh, historians out there that are uh, intimately involved in trying to verify air claims and, and stuff like that. And I think in a lot of ways that's a bit of a mutt scheme because we can never know for sure. Um, I would. I would argue that nobody scored anywhere near what they actually claimed to. It's just the nature of air warfare. Um, you're in a fast-paced uh, environment, um, fighting for your life. Um, you're seeing things whiz by. Um, you think you get a guy. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But it's very clear that there's a lot of uh, claims that were made that weren't justified, that the plane would dive out of sight, spin away, and, and live to fight another day, or, or something like that. Um, but if you look at Kalashaw's claims, they're more verifiable than almost any other of the great aces that you can go through the records and, and um, 
sort of match his claims to actual losses on the German side um, at a, a level that the other aces aren't supported by. Um, do, I think, does that, do I think that makes him any better or worse than any of the others? No, I don't. Um, I think that the great aces were the great aces. I think the number of kills they actually had is, is immaterial. Saying bishop is better than manic is, is kind of one of the more ridiculous arguments I've heard. Uh, 72 versus 73 kills, whatever. Um, but the fact is they were the most effective at their trade. And they went up, they uh, were effective, they got the job done, and they survived in situations where a lot of guys wouldn't survive a day, a week, or a month. And they went up again and again and came back. So there's something to be said for that. Great. Yeah, here. Mike, uh, did I get it right that the um, air ground tactics of the RAF changed um, in Northwest Europe, but didn't change in the desert? As I understood it, the, the Army Cooperation Branch of the RAF fell apart after the fall of France in 1940, and they went to the fighter defensive and Churchill ordered a, a uh, well, an offensive bomber attack against Germany and they developed the long range bombers. Yeah. But it sounds as though Kolbyshaw was off in this little backwater with whatever he could grab and was left with the old tactics, which he defined, and then it became more yeah, I, with the whole story of uh, the development of air support is really a con, uh, complex one because there, in the, the British case there, were, uh, there was close air support doctrine being developed in the United Kingdom. Uh, there was close air support doctrine that was being developed um, out of the Battle of France and then there was that sort of uh, Western Desert example. And they all had similar ideas, they all had similar ways of working. Um, but I would argue that the thing that really distinguished Kalashaw's operations in the Western Desert was success. He had taken these ideas, he'd employed them in battle, and he'd proved they worked. Um, a lot of the other ideas were just academic. They hadn't had any kind of um, airing in public, so to speak. Um, and there's a lot of argument about where these ideas really came from. Um, one of the, the best examples I have to sort of show that the Western Desert was, was the way to um, sort of understand this is that the American Army Air Forces went into North Africa with a really good concept of how to conduct tactical air operations, but they went into combat operations and allowed themselves to be dominated by the Army and fell into this uh, air umbrella defensive operations kind of thing and failed completely and utterly early on in the, the North African campaign. Um, the Americans had good doctrine, but they wouldn't, weren't able to put it into place. Um, the way that the American ideas were finally um, made, the way the American Air Force operated, was by pointing to the example of the Western Desert Air Force, saying, look, here's these ideals, here's these arguments. Conningham, um, those quotes I'd showed you, had given a, a presentation to all the senior Allied generals in Tripoli on the 5th of February, uh, 1943. And uh, that's when the message was finally received. And it wasn't because the British ideas were better than the American ideas. It was the, the question of success. It was the fact that the British had taken these ideas and successfully employed them in battle. And that was finally enough to convince the American Army generals that this is what the American Army Air Forces should be doing. And uh, from that point on, the British and the Americans sort of develop their attack air plans um, along a, a, a common uh, scale. And when they went into Normandy, um, everything they're doing in Normandy is essentially what had been learned in the Western Desert and was, was kept as the main way of doing things. And in fact, if you look at the way Air Forces do close air support today, it's all those, or tactical air operations today, it's all those same concepts still being the, the way to keep things operated. But it's not a, a clear straight line A to B to C, it's kind of a zigzag line and this is important and this is important and this is kind of the main thrust. We take one more question. One more question? Doug, do you have a question? Well, I had a question, uh, as the one was said here about uh, uh, polished uh, embroidered stories there's nothing wrong with it, but is it, is it possible that that 
it, it's possible. I don't think he was. I don't think he was spinning these tales at that point. He wasn't writing anything for public consumption at that point. I mean, he he was a, a fixture in the officers' mess. He would tell the the stories, but that's not the kind of thing that was unique or that would necessarily get you in the. I, I, I don't think so. I think he took offense at something. I don't know what. And I don't know that we'll ever know what. So, Sorry, Tyler, did you have a question? The uh, joint aspects of Kalashaw's career are especially interesting his time on horseback, his time on an aircraft carrier. Um, was there, you've run across anything where in his efforts to develop different aspects of the air side of the, of the joint fight, uh, where he pushed back on Navy and Army colleagues and said, instead of chaining us to this air umbrella idea, here are things you can do. Um, here are ways you can modify your tactics which would defuse the enemy's aircraft. Yeah, um, j just to keep this brief, I think you can see that where uh, close air support fails, you have air commanders and Army commanders operating in silos. They're not talking to each other, they're not working well together. When it's successful, a lot of it is personality driven because they talk, they cooperate. And I think that's where Kalashaw's um, career of experience really came into play. He'd worked with the Army, he'd worked with the Navy, he had, should we say, cred with the other services, um, and he was willing to, to talk to them. And you see, not so much that he knows better than anybody else, but that he can get his ideas across the other services without. Um, causing problems to talk to them to come up with joint plans as opposed to two separate plans kind of working at the same time to different ends so yeah I think his experience with the other services is what really made the difference because he knew how to talk to the other services and could get along with them okay. thank you there's I have a question for me. It's a three-part a three-part <laughs> what was the highest rank to call shop Obtained. Air Vice Marshal. To, to, where did he retire to after he was retired in 43? Uh, British Columbia. Right. And so my final part. Did the Canadian Royal Canadian Air Force, of course, make any overture to him to give him some dignity in his retirement as they did with Billy Bishop, who was far more uh, able? Um, um, there was room for him in the Royal Canadian Air Force, or was there any evidence that you could find where there was some seconding of them to the RCA. That, that's a really good question and not anything I've ever come across before. Um, as far as I know, he had nothing to do with the, the Air Force after he retired. Um, I know that he was given an official um, RCAF funeral and that um, some CF-104 um, uh, starfighters flew over his funeral, but I've never seen any evidence that he was sort of used, brought in, uh, fed it in the military after the war. Because it was only his mid-40s, he was a young man. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for giving a profile and background of a man that probably a lot of people just knew by name. Thank you very, very much. It was a very interesting presentation. This has been another in the series of podcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find notices of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives on our website at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the Institute, this is Eric Morse saying please subscribe to our YouTube channel and thank you for listening.